Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's BU Industry Insiders webinar, How to Flip Resistant Colleagues into Rabid Supporters, The Five Keys to Influence with or Without Authority. My name is Jeff Murphy, and I'm an Associate Director in the BU Alumni Relations Office, as well as a proud alumnus of the BU Questrom School of Business. Today's webinar is sponsored by Boston University Alumni Relations and is offered to our 321,000 alumni around the globe. Throughout your career, BU is committing, committed to helping you define and achieve your professional goals. We aim to do this by providing alumni with access to a series of valuable online tools and social media communities. It's important that we get your opinion on how we're doing, so we very much look forward to receiving your feedback via a survey that will be emailed to all of you later today. I know we have alumni joining us today from places like Quebec, Rome, Toronto, London, San Francisco, Atlanta, Springfield, Illinois, and as always, dozens of Massachusetts alumni from towns like Somerville, Belmont, Dorchester, Brighton, Watertown, and more. For each and every one of you out there, please know that we really do value your opinion on this and every program that we offer. Before I introduce today's speaker, some brief housekeeping notes. As you know by now, this webinar is being hosted on the Adobe Connect online meeting platform. If you experience any trouble with the audio or visual portions of today's presentation, I'll ask that you please contact Adobe Connect directly. If you want to jot down their phone number, Adobe Connect can be reached at 1-800-422-3623. Today's presentation is being recorded and will soon be made available for on-demand viewing on the Alumni Association website found at www.bu.edu slash alumni. Our speaker today is very eager to answer any questions you have, and you're welcome to submit them throughout the presentation using the Q&A chat box you see at the bottom of your screen. I hope to get to as many questions as we can during today's webinar. It's now my pleasure to introduce our speaker for the day. Presenting from New York City is Questrom School of Business alumnus Ephraim Schachter. Ephraim is an award-winning executive coach and consultant to senior executives and executive teams in Fortune 500 companies for close to two decades. He helps C-suite clients and their teams deliberately choose behaviors and actions to optimize organizational success. Ephraim's specialties include providing C-suite executives with the space, frameworks, paths, and perspectives to hone strategic thinking, operational effectiveness, executive polish, talent management, inspirational leadership, and change management. Ephraim recently launched C-Suite Accelerator, a groundbreaking online approach to helping senior leaders speed their path to the C-Suite. And Ephraim, I hope you'll tell us a little bit more about that at the end of the presentation today. I feel very lucky that you agreed to do this presentation for us. I found you uh, after a great post you did on LinkedIn. Uh, so thank you so much for being here with us today. I'll go ahead and get your slide deck up and running, and then the floor will be all yours. Okay. Thanks, Jeff. Appreciate it. <clears throat> and I'm delighted to be here as well. Questrom grad myself, although it's been a couple of years. Um, happy to uh, engage with the community this way. And so, welcome. Hello, partners. Today we're going to talk about how you can get the people who typically resist and hold up your efforts predisposed to agreeing with you and supporting your recommendations. That's what I mean by flipping resistant colleagues into rabid supporters. And so let's sort of paint a picture here if we can while we get started. You know, here you are walking through your life. You go to work. You're trying to do the right things. You want to achieve your potential. You want to make an impact. You want to garner recognition for the good work that you do. And hey, why not even maybe earn ever-increasing financial rewards while you do it? And so in order to do that, you show up at work and you try to do your best, not just to do the work, but to also move people along with you. And as you guys know, as you get more and more further along with your career and get into more senior roles, the impact you used to make as an individual contributor begins to dissipate relative to the need to manage people, manage managers, manage managers who manage swaths of people. It really revolves or devolves into a question of influence. How well can I move people to get stuff done? And the people who represent my client base and the people who are in my C-suite accelerator community, members of uh, what we call Exco, uh, people that I coach individually one-on-one, -on -one, it really is about how do I get stuff done through other people? 
And so influence becomes a key thing. And in these very matrix organizations that I do a ton of work in, influence becomes even t even uh, bigger and more important because you have all these matrix organizations where I may have one solid line, but I also might have one or two dotted lines. And there are a lot of people I need to get on board. If I'm in a function, I need to get people on board. There are a lot of people I need to get on board in order to move my initiatives. It's not just about my good idea. And so if that's an issue for you, I'm glad you're here. So let's sort of paint a picture, right? Here you are walking along trying to do your stuff. He said as he tried to advance the slide. There, you should be seeing a slide that says the problem. You're trying to get your stuff done. You've got some great ideas. You've got some initiatives you want to move. You want to move forward. And lo and behold, the first thing you bump into is you've got colleagues who resist your efforts. It actually feels like they're kind of trying to stick their foot out and trip you. There are people who, it seems to you, when you come up with something, they're always the first one to uh, shoot at it. They're the first ones to poke holes at it. They're the first ones to challenge it. And so the first part of the frustration is I've got colleagues resisting me. It's not just about the strength of my idea. Second issue is, you know, I don't know if it's that I've got colleagues resisting me. Maybe that's part of them. But I sure have a lot of colleagues who are just incompetent. They can't do it. I will tell you many of my clients that I begin a coaching engagement with, that's the first thing they tell me. Boy, I, I'm so surrounded by so many incompetents around here. If they only knew the value I have, then they would just go along with me. So first is they may resist. Second. They may not seem to get it. And maybe they're not resisting. Maybe they kind of get it. But, you know, they're just fixated on their own stuff. They're out trying to drive their own agenda. And when you can't break through, because they're resistant or because they don't get it or because they're driving their own agenda, it can be very frustrating. That can be a hard place to be. And so I'd ask Jeff if you can pop up our first little poll here. You know, when you're not getting through, I'm curious to hear from you guys. When you're not getting through, what's been your biggest concern when you're not getting through? One is, you know, I can't really influence other people if I'm not getting through to them. Another one is I can't build my profile in the organization. I'm never going anywhere here if I don't get a bigger profile. Another one is, you know, I'm a little concerned that, you know, I think I'm in line to keep moving up, but if I'm not getting through to people, if I'm not getting resonance, that might harm or delay my next promotion. Obviously, the last one is all of the above. So what do you guys think? Ephraim, are you able to see wait. those answers as they're coming up? I am. I am. Great. Interesting. We're seeing a lot of all of the aboves. And we're seeing a piece of not being able to influence. Yeah, so that's the struggle, right? I mean, that's the struggle. The struggle is uh, I can't just live in an echo chamber. I can't just live in, in a metaphoric cube. I've got to get stuff done through other people. And so when I'm not getting through, it can be hugely frustrated because, frustrating because I know I've got so much to offer. But it's not happening here. So... If we can just move this, and so our final numbers, I, I'm guessing everybody can see we had 59% uh, with all of the above, about 34% with the influence issue, then a little drop on not being able to build, in, uh, build the organization. Great, thank you. So this is the, um, this is the part of the infomercial where the, where the voiceover says, what if I could show you a way <laughs> where you don't have to be stuck here? where you can fix this. So we said that that was the problem. But when you do this right, there's a promise. When you do this right, rather than having people who are just resisting, rather than your colleagues resisting, your colleagues are receiving. They're receptive to you. 
And I just want you to think about and imagine the last time you had a receptive colleague, what it was like, how easy that was. You come into their office, you shoot them the email, and when you're trying to move an initiative, when you've got an idea, when you're trying to get through a, some kind of roadblock, they're receptive. They're waiting to hear what you have to say. Second, rather than them seeming incompetent or they're not getting it, what we feel instead is that they grasp the value. They get it. They, they grasp the value of my ideas. They grasp my value. When you do it right, they grasp your value. They're interested in hearing. They're interested in learning from you. And finally, rather than they're driving their own agenda, they get on board a shared agenda. They recognize that working with you is going to help them accomplish their goals. And when they do all those things, the net is that they support you. You don't have a resistant colleague. You've got a rabid supporter. And I'm going to suggest very strongly that the longer you work with people and they have that track record of working with you when you're able to accomplish this, the support increases and increases to where it does feel like rabid support. They can't wait to work with you. I had a CFO I worked with recently. She came into an organization I've been working with for, for 10 or 12 years with different management teams there. And uh, she came in really pushing people around. She had a clear agenda, she thought. She bossed people around. And I was brought in to coach her when she'd only been in the organization about uh, four months. And she was really in jeopardy. Uh, in fact, the reason that they had even given her the, the gig was to increase the number of candidates for the horse race to succeed the CEO they knew was going to be retiring in two and a half years. And she was about to derail pretty quickly. And we worked through this set of behaviors I'm going to walk you through right now. And I'm happy to say she mastered them, she applied herself, and she is in the running now. We'll see what happens. I think an announcement's going to happen in January. We'll see. So. All right. So I'm going to take us into the substance of the program now. Still getting used to these adjusters, adjust, uh, adjusting the slides. Oh, and I just want to say this: if you're on right now, hang on with us. Hang on. There's going to be some good, uh, some good stuff at the end. I'm going to share with you. Um, some's going to be free. Something's going to be paid for if you're interested. But there are uh, things to wait for at the end of the presentation. So we're going to go over five key behaviors, the five key behaviors that are going to take you from uh, resistant colleagues to rabid supporters. And I'm going to just give you a spoiler alert up front. It's about trust. The reason most people are getting in the way is because there's a trust issue. Now, that trust issue may be well-founded. It, uh, it may not be. We don't know. But it's about trust. And if you don't have that trust, you're not going to get anywhere. And you're going to get that trust if you follow these behaviors. And so what I'm going to say, I'm going to say first is the behaviors are anchored in a set of values. You know, some people come to me and they say, you know, is the stuff that you're going to be talking about kind of manipulative? I, I remember in the 80s there was, I'm forgetting the guy's name, but he used to release these books on like 21 expert closing techniques for your next sale. And I remember I would bristle when I saw something like that because I thought a closing technique suggests to me that you might just be trying to pressure someone into doing something that's not good for them. You might just be acting in your own self-interest. You might just be manipulating. And I'm just going to say very clearly, nothing we're going to talk about is about manipulation. It's about values. It's about high integrity. And it's about approaching this from a place of authenticity. And if anyone ever tells you in any professional development capacity that the path to achieving more is by not being authentic or by not serving some core values that you think are of high integrity, reject that advice. Reject that advice. And so the values we're going to talk about today and we're going to anchor our work in are the following. Openness. Curiosity creativity, 
candor. I don't know if you're taking notes, but you're going to have more of an opportunity in a half a second to see this. But openness, curiosity, creativity, and candor. So I'm going to walk you through our framework that is going to be basically our home base. It's going to explain the entirety of what we cover today on one slide. There's a lot of information there, so I'm going to just ask you to try to track with me, okay? We don't have the capacity for a build on these slides, so just stay with me. Okay. We call this the Support Maximizer, and this is our framework for how we flip resistant colleagues into rabbit supporters. And so I mentioned we had a series of values we're going to try to serve, openness, curiosity, creativity, and candor. And so the items we have flanking the center of this uh, downward triangle, um, the items in red and the items in green, are there as what you are giving your colleague what you are giving your colleague. And so I'm going to start at the top with openness. Openness is about, obviously, being open, being receptive to what your colleague has to say. If we don't offer our colleague openness, what we give them is darkness. We don't give them uh, the ability to see what they can accomplish. Next is curiosity. Curiosity is really caring about what the other person is trying to accomplish themselves. And when we don't give them curiosity, we give them what? We give them indifference. I had the good fortune, I was telling Jeff, I had the good fortune when I was uh, back at BU um, to study with uh, the Nobel Prize winner, uh, Professor Elie Wiesel, uh, who recently passed away. And uh, Professor Wiesel used to say, the opposite of love is not hate. Love and hate are both passions. The opposite of love is indifference. And I'd offer that to you guys as well, just to think about that. When we offer someone our curiosity, or we deny someone our curiosity, we're giving them our indifference. That's really something we'd want to avoid for a bunch of reasons. Next is being creative together. Helping to be creative with your colleague. When you're not, you're giving them limits. Limits on what they can accomplish, limits on what they can imagine, limits on what can be done. And finally, candor, just saying it like it is. When you don't share that with your colleague, what you give them is ambiguity. And when you give your colleague darkness, indifference, limits, and ambiguity, you're not helping them. Yes, it's bad business. It's also bad karma. It's also probably not consistent with who you are. We don't necessarily think in these terms at work, but they apply. So let's go to the right side of the framework. When we give our colleagues openness, on the other hand, we give them agency. We give them the ability to get stuff done for themselves, the opportunity to be self-determining. And the way we're going to do it, that KB stands for key behavior. Key behavior number one, the way we're going to do it is going to be we're going to be transparent. In a moment, we're going to start off on that section. Next, in order to be, when we give them curiosity, we give them significance. We make them important. We help show them that we believe and know that they matter. And when we do that, the key behavior we do to do that is we show interest. We're interested. So key behavior number two is be interested. Next, when we offer our creativity to think through things, to get on the same page, to jointly problem solve, what we give our colleague is possibilities, the possibilities of getting things done that they want, things done that they've imagined, things done getting things done they haven't even had the opportunity to imagine yet. We take that as our charge. And finally, when we're straightforward, when we offer candor, we give them clarity. And we're going to do that by being plain spoken. So by being transparent, being interested, being win-win, and being plain spoken, we offer all of this to our clients. Our colleagues, I'm sorry, might be our clients too. Wait, Ephraim, I thought you said, notice my speaking of myself in the third person. Wait, Ephraim, I thought you said that this was about how I flip resistant colleagues into rabid supporters. Yeah, so what you may have noticed, folks, it's about them. It's not about us. Because if we can help them the right way, we can always move our agenda. We can always move our agenda. So I'm curious for you guys. We're going to put up poll number two. And I'm going to want to know, Jeff, if you can get that centered. There it is. I just offered you a set of key value, uh, values and key behaviors. 
And I'm curious which one resonates the most with you guys. First one was openness to be transparent. Second was curiosity, be interested. Third, creativity so that you could be win-win. And fourth, candor. I know the truth is you probably have a hard time selecting because they all seem to have value. But I'm curious if any of them are the winners in terms of which resonates the most with you right now. Keeping the poll open. So far, uh, openness is clearly um, winning the winning our little horse race. I feel like I'm at the fair, and you know, there's uh, at the carnival, and you know, there's a, there's those uh, kiosks you go, those booths where you have like a water gun, and you're trying to shoot it, and there's a horse race, and if you aim correctly, uh, you're able to big the win the big stuffed animal that's uh, been stitched together probably by uh, slave labor and uh, will fall apart as soon as you put it in your car. Uh, that's the way the race looks. Okay. Let's see. Okay, I think a lot of you uh, have weighed in. And so uh, large amounts for openness, being transparent. I'm going to be curious over the course of this, if you can submit this in your questions to Jeff too, I'd be curious to hear the reason it resonates for you. You know, So is it because you have found that when you've been open, uh, you have enjoyed your experience more of work? Is it that you found that um, you struggle to get your colleagues to be open? I would be interested in why that one seemed to be so strong uh, with respect to uh, how you guys hold it. Very interesting to note. All right, folks. So let's get into it. So I promised you we would look at openness first, and that would take us to key behavior number one, to be transparent. And by being transparent, what I mean is showing them yours, right? Opening the kimono, being forthright about, here's what I'm thinking. Here's why I'm thinking it. And so I want you to consider the following. If you guys have ever done any uh, mediation training, you may have heard the following parable. You've heard a couple of other capacities too, but I'll, I'll, I'll run it by you again, and I'm curious as to your reactions. Here's the old tale of the children on Mother's Day, and uh, uh, the father, it's 6.30 in the morning, he awakens upstairs with a lot of noise, runs downstairs because he wants to let his wife finally sleep in once for once in her life. He goes down, and here's the two kids arguing over an orange. And they're both kind of in this dug-in posture where they've each got a hand on this big orange and they're yanking it back and forth. And the first kid says, my orange. Second kid says, no, my orange. First kid says, no, my orange. And so they're going back and forth and the father shushes them, says, nope, now it's my orange, takes the orange, cuts it in half, and gets, gives each child a perfectly cut half. You know, we fathers sort of pride ourselves on being coordinated around being able to Cut a perfectly cut half, right? <laughs> so gives him the perfect cut halves. He's very proud of himself. He gives uh, each kid the half, and what happens? They start crying. They yell and curse at him, and they run out of the room. And so he is perplexed. What happened here? So after he gives him a couple minutes to cool down, he goes to the first child's room, and he says, I am really puzzled. What did you think was going to happen? We only have one orange. And so the child says, you know what? I needed uh, the the pulp of an entire orange to make mom orange juice for Mother's Day. Half a pulp doesn't give me anything. Thanks a lot, buddy. You messed me up. Okay. So the father, tail between his legs, walks to the other child's room and says the same thing. You know, I'm, I'm puzzled. What did you think was going to happen? We only had one orange. And child number two says, you know, you really messed me up, man. I needed the rind of an entire orange to be able to bake mom muffins for Mother's Day. And because I didn't, because I only have a half now, I'm stuck and I can't bake. Thanks a lot, man. So father walks away and realizes that he fell into a trap. And the trap he fell into was he heard what stances both kids had. He didn't hear what their objectives were behind the stances. So let's talk about that for First, a stance is your position, your conclusion. The orange is mine. Thing you want to do. 
let's get Italian for lunch today. That's a stance. But underneath this stance is the reason for the stance, an objective. Why do you want to get Italian today? I heard it's a new place. It opened up. It seemed pretty cool. Why do you want the orange? I want it for baking. Now, if the kids had those skills, what they would have said is, I want this, I want this orange because I need an entire rind for baking. The other kid just said, I want this orange because I need an entire rind. I'm sorry, I need an entire pulp for juicing. So the first piece we said you're going to be transparent. What do we mean by that? It means you've got to show your work, as they used to tell our kids when they would do their math homework. Show the work. Don't just guess. Being transparent means I don't ask you to figure out the machinations. Is that a word? Machinations of my mind. The mechanisms. The inner workings of my mind. I tell you. I don't make you guess. For a couple of reasons. One is I want you to understand me. The other is... I want you to have adequate information that's clear. So stance and objectives, show your work. I'll give you an example of this. Uh, let's assume I've got, I'm frustrated with marketing in my company. So I say, I recommend we hire a new chief marketing officer. That's my stance. Now some people might agree with it, they might disagree with it. Somebody might say no, somebody might say okay, great idea. But I haven't offered up a rationale, I haven't offered up my objectives. So I'll say, I recommend we hire a new chief marketing officer. We need a coherent strategy around where we're going. I don't think we have one right now. And we need consistency across our different distribution channels. Right now, you know, our online looks different than our print, looks different than all these other areas. So for those two reasons, I recommend we hire a new marketing officer, chief marketing officer. Now it's not just boom position. Now it's not just give me the orange. I have been transparent. I have opened the kimono. I have shown my colleague what I want to accomplish and why. I can't tell you how many sessions on C-Suite Accelerator and our executive committee when we have our coaching sessions and people will talk about initiatives they're working on. And I'll ask them, so what does that person want? I don't know. Did you tell them why you wanted this? No. It's obvious. Well, no, it's not obvious. Nothing's obvious. You can't get inside someone's head. We all think we can get in some, inside someone's head. You can't. Do you guys remember your first year of psychology? What was it? Fundamental attribution error. It means we attribute meaning to other people's behavior, and we're usually wrong. Right? So how can I be generous around this? How can I be transparent? I share my stances and my objectives. If you've got any questions, leave them in the box. I'm going to keep this going. So that was key behavior number one. So in the service of the value of openness, we're going to be transparent. Next, in the service of the value of curiosity, we're going to be interested. We're going to be interested. And what am I talking about here? I'm talking about digging deep. It's our job to dig deep. It's our job to show curiosity. So if you think about transparency being around you showed them yours, now we're going to ask for theirs. I shared mine. I want to hear it from you. Now is when you want to take in their stance, and their objectives so you can know what matters. I'm going to tell you a little story about an exercise I do in one of my classes um, that really demonstrates what I'm talking about here. So I want to say a couple of things to you first, and that is first is we all have taken an active, listen, learned an active listening technique in one of the programs that we've learned in our careers, and still none of us actively listen, or we barely do at all. It's remarkable to me. What we do instead of really listening to people is we solve our own problems or we just politely wait our turn to speak. We jump into solution, we cut people off, we say, no, do it this way. But what your colleague wants is to be heard. Your colleague wants to be heard. You may not know what your colleague means. You don't have it all figured out. It takes a certain amount of arrogance to assume that we do have it all figured out. So, um, it's about listening, it's about digging, it's about asking. I'll tell you this exercise that I do when I'm teaching people um, about how they increase their bearing as an executive. And I give people two sheets of paper. I break, I break the group out. Group A gets a question that says, you know, they're in pairs, tell your partner about a project you have and you're working on. Right? So that's what they're preparing to do. That's what I give them a minute to do. 
And then the instruction I give the person on the receiving end of that conversation, group B, is it's a big math problem. It says divide 12,749,623 by 14. So what happens when the exercise starts is the person starts explaining, person A starts explaining what they're working on. In other words, what matters to me? And then person B has a long division problem in their head that they're trying to figure out. And they're sending their colleague the signals that they're not really paying attention to the substance. And when we debrief it, the people in group A say, boy, that felt rotten. This person wasn't paying any attention to me. And the metaphor I go back to is, you know what? This is what happens in real life. How many of us are solving our own problems while our colleague is speaking? The problem may not be a math problem. It may be, ooh, do I have my stuff together for my next meeting? It may be, ooh, did I remember to pick up the dry cleaning? It may be a variety of things. But am I actually listening? You've got to empty your head to listen, folks. You've got to listen. Listening is about the other person. It's not about being right. It's not about weighing in first. I hope that makes sense. So I'm going to give you a little tool so that you can accomplish this really super well. And we're going to call this the five A's. I thought that was on the slide. It's not. But we're going to continue to be interested with the five A's. I think you're not, asking, you're not curious as to why we call these the five A's if you're looking at the slide I'm looking at. So first, what do we do? We show them ours. That's the, step number one is the transparency step, right? Articulate your stance and objectives. So I might say, back to the first thing we talked about, I recommend we hire a new chief marketing officer. We need a coherent strategy around where we're going, and we need some consistency across the different distribution channels. Next, I ask for my colleagues' input. How about you? What do you think? Next, I have to actively listen. It's not about my pounding in my point. It's about my gathering. Listening is a gathering activity. It is not an evaluating activity. That's problem solving. Listening is gathering. So I'm going to actively listen. Then I'm going to affirm them. I'm going to say, well, that's great. Let's talk about it. Or I see you feel strongly about that. Let's talk about it. Now, if they've only given me their stance but not their objectives, I might ask for their objectives here. All right? So let's see what this might look like, this conversation. I say, I recommend we hire a new chief marketing officer. We need a coherent strategy around where we're going, and we need some consistency across distribution channels. My colleague says, nope, we can't hire a new chief marketing officer. First, well, let's assume they don't share their stance, right? I say, OK, I see you feel strongly about that. That's great. Then I ask the question, so tell me why. What's your thinking behind that, right? I'm asking for their objectives. And my colleague says, well, it's probably about $250,000 we don't have in the budget. And our marketing is decentralized to the business units. It's going to really annoy the marketing people within all those business units because they're going to feel like we're usurping them if we centralize that with the CMO. Ah, so now we've taken the conversation. The conversation's no longer, I want the orange, I want, you know, versus I want the orange. The conversation now is not, I want a CMO, I don't want a CMO. It's about objectives. And I have internalized my colleagues' objectives. So if I just pound them over the head with mine over and over again, am I helping them make a decision that they're going to buy into? Am I helping them make, be, feel less resistant? Who's the incompetent now? Is it them or is it me? And who looks like they're driving their own agenda? Them or me, right? This is my opportunity. This is my opportunity to really hear them. And that's why we're going to be interested. We're going to show our curiosity. We're going to be interested. And that leads us into key behavior number three. We said that we're going to have the value of creativity that we're going to serve by being win-win. And so I want you to think of being win-win as your opportunity for a transformation. And the transformation is from an opponent of the person that you're trying to influence to a joint problem solver. Imagine that you're two people on the same side of the table trying to figure something out instead of two people at loggerheads. And so you're going to really need to understand their objectives and their aspirations to do this. You're going to have to help them win too. You know, there's some quotes don't completely apply here, but I like them anyway. There's one attributed to Sun Tzu. Um, 
where he said in The Art of War, build your, build your opponent a golden bridge to retreat across. Right? The idea was it's not about winning. It's about creating a win-win. Sadaharu Oh, who was a uh, very famous uh, home run hitter in Japan, I guess in the 70s, big career, um, he was asked about his secret. And he said something, that, I'm paraphrasing now, but he said something to the effect of, I see the pitcher as my partner. It's our force together that produces the outcome I'm looking for. Right? It's a partnership. Interesting. I'm going to tell you a little story about a client of mine, Jack, not his real name. <laughs> He was a COO of a global media company. He was a COO of the EMEA division, right? Uh, Europe, Middle East, Africa. And his boss's boss, the COO of the entire enterprise, very big company, global company, really wanted to groom Jack to eventually succeed him in, say, seven or eight years when he retired. It was going to require a promotion first to the London office. That's kind of where you went. That's when you were on deck, you went to the London office. And so... Uh, his boss's boss, the enterprise C COO, goes to the uh, CEO of the enterprise, uh, who's a tough guy by any rights. He's someone um, that you probably all would know by name if I'd share it. And um, CEO says, "We can't give. We can't put this guy in succession line for you. He is a thug." Whoa, Jack's a thug. You know the reputation that Jack had was he got a lot of stuff done, but he left a lot of bodies strewn in his path didn't do it collaboratively. He had a lot of colleagues who didn't want to work with him. So we got to coaching Jack, and Jack learned our steps. So the first one you recall being transparent, he became transparent. You remember he had to be interested also. And the third piece here, he had to learn to be win-win. And the format we did, the format we followed for Jack to learn to be win-win was the following tool that I want you guys to learn because it works. And we're going to call this LPCA. LPCA, why? Because uh, it's an acronym. I used to practice law, and I'm telling you, if it wasn't for mnemonic devices, I wouldn't have survived. No way, no how. I think uh, bio students do the same thing. Right? So our, our stages. The first thing you need to do, once you've, once you've uh, been curious, right? you've heard of the object, you've, you've listed your objectives to your client. You've gotten the objective in your I'm sorry, your colleague. You've gotten your, the objectives from your colleague. You're going to list them all out. You're going to get them all out on a page. So in our instance, it's going to be I, we need a coherent strategy around where we're going for marketing. We need consistency across different, cha dis different distribution channels. That was mine. My colleague's was we can't afford 250K, and it's going to annoy people if we try to centralize what is decentralized. Right? So we get all those on the table. We list our objectives. Next, we propose maximizing solutions. What do I mean by a maximizing solution? We try to meet every objective. What if, remember I said win-win? What if we could satisfy every objective? Wouldn't that be the same as one child getting the entire rind, one child getting the entire pulp? It'd be 100%, 100%. It's a 200% solution. We're not necessarily going to be able to do that, but wouldn't an 80-80 be better than a compromise down the middle? So we're going to try to maximize solutions. So we're going to be thinking about how we accomplish all those things. And we are going to talk together and figure something out. So let's assume after a bit of back and forth, we decide, I know what we'll do in this instance. We're going to bring all the marketing people in a task force where we, where we articulate a company-wide marketing strategy and vision. So that satisfied the need for a vision, satisfies the need to get uh, people to not feel like they've been marginalized. Next, we're going to hire a contractor to work across the businesses to keep the efforts consistent. We'll hire that contractor part-time, a consultant. That'll keep the numbers down. So wait, what just happened? We may have just satisfied the different objectives because we talked about it. I got what I needed. They got what they needed. So now we commit to next steps. Let's talk about what we're doing next. And then finally, you affirm your colleague. You want to tell your colleague what a pleasure it is to work with them. What a pleasure it is to be productive. Because you're going to come back to this client, to this colleague. You are not uh, selling your used car. These are people you're working with over and over again in your organization. These win-wins are key, are key. All right.
why. So that's being win-win. I'm going to keep us going. Let's power through this. Next, I'm going to say, we said there's the value of candor, and we are going to be plain spoken to live that. And by being plain spoken, I mean literally using the simplest, most straightforward terms when you're talking with people. So one of the things I'm going to tell you that I've discovered through many um, interactions uh, with different people I've coached and by teaching executive bearing classes across organizations and also within C-Suite Accelerator is when people name someone with, with an elevated executive bearing, they typically name the same things. They say the person's got open body language, like a op straight, open, square shoulders. They make great, great eye contact. They speak a little loudly, not too loudly, but really loudly. I'm sorry, a little loudly and really clearly. And then they say this, these people speak plainly. They're not flowery, not show-offy. Their speech is stripped down. It's too the point. They speak to the point. I've never heard anyone when identifying people they think have enormous executive presence. I've never heard anyone say, this guy sounds like a college professor. This woman used a series of expressions I've never heard before. They never say that. They say this person just spoke in very simple terms. It doesn't mean they said everything they thought. Being plain spoken doesn't mean I share everything, and it doesn't mean everything's okay to be shared, but it means when I speak, I speak clearly. I don't make you work to understand. I don't make you work to understand. And isn't that consistent with our theme of being transparent? I'm just keeping it simple, straightforward, so you can what? You can trust me. You can trust me. I'm not hiding anything. There's no sleight of hand here. You speak plainly and you start with the point. We call that inductive reasoning. You start with the point. All right. So to that end, don't try to build dramatically to your point, folks. Start with the point. Be simple. Be easy to consume. I tell my clients, be a homepage. And by that I mean, give the top line stuff and let your user click on the link they're interested in in your conversation. Finally, on this topic, you know, avoid business jargon. We all have it in organizations. You've got a, you get hit with a flurry of, a, you know, of acronyms. Um, just don't use business jargon. Speak plainly. And finally, we're going to be consistent. We didn't talk on our on our downward triangle uh, about this too much, but it's in the what what I essentially mean here is do those four things consistently. Do all those things consistently. And so, you know, um, a very wise man named Bruce Springsteen once said, it's a quote, getting an audience is hard. Sustaining an audience is hard. It demands a consistency of thought, of purpose, and of action over a long period of time. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna repeat that. Getting an audience is hard. Sustaining an audience is hard. It demands a consistency of thought, of purpose, and of action over a long period of time. Recognize, folks, that consistency isn't you do something twice. It means this is the way you act. It means this is who you are. It means this is what your brand is. This is how you're known. This person consistently supports these values in the way she behaves, right? Consistency of thought, purpose, action. Man, I love that. Thought, purpose, and action. Consistently around these behaviors. And you can then move people. Remember also, you may be in a hole. Sometimes, and here's what I mean by that. Sometimes I start to coach a client when that client is um, already considered to not behave well. Maybe they're not seen as someone who tries to influence in this values-based way. Maybe they see, they're seen as someone who tries to either use a hammer or to be too passive-aggressive, right? What if it's you, right? It reminds me of a joke. I don't, there's, there's a joke, uh, there's a, a movie I saw, actually when I was at BU, it was called My Favorite Year. Don't know if you guys remember it, Peter O'Toole, Mark Lynn Baker. Very funny if you can see it. So um, 
character, the Mark Lynn Baker character, is trying to ex- – he's a comedy writer trying to explain to his not particularly funny girlfriend how to tell a joke. He tries to teach her the following joke. Uh, unsuccessfully, by the way, but I just want you to hear the joke. <laughs> Man walks into a psychiatrist's office with a frog on his head. The doctor asks, may I help you? And the frog replies, yes, get this idiot off my behind. Now, the language in the film is a bit more coarse than that, but you get what I'm saying. It's worth noting that right now some other people might see you as the problem. They might see you as the person they don't trust. You want to consistently reframe. You want to consistently engage in these behaviors. So let me give you a quick review as we bring this puppy in for a landing. Okay. We said at the start of our work, what we're going to do is we are going to be, oh, we're going to serve our values of openness, curiosity, creativity, and candor. And the way that we're going to do them is through a series of behaviors. We're going to be transparent. We're going to be interested. We're going to be win-win, and we're going to be plain spoken. And finally, we're going to be consistent. We're going to do these consistently. And when we do this, we will give our colleagues agency. We will make, give them their significance. We'll open up possibilities and deal with them with clarity. And when we do, we can flip our resistant colleagues into rabid supporters. So, Jeff, if you can just put a poll up, our third poll real quick. All right, this one's more open-ended. Curious to what you think. What are you going to do today to implement something you learned here? I'm hoping that maybe one or two of the items that we covered in particular felt like this is actionable right now. What are you going to do? What do you think you might do? And right after that, I'm going to show you some of the goodies that I have and the freebies um, real briefly before we go into Q&A. Try to show a colleague that I'm curious about their area. Excellent. Excellent. Actively listen. Be win-win. Excellent. Jeez, you don't know how powerful this stuff is, even one at a time. Affirm my colleagues more clearly. Be consistent. Remove distractions so that I can listen. Be win-win, be consistent, practice speaking plainly. Excellent. Be more interested in what they are interested in. Nice. Try to get less frustrated with a colleague perceived as incompetent. Oh, man. Now, that's that's one of those serenity now. If you remember Seinfeld, serenity now. Yep. Getting less frustrated. Try to show a colleague that I'm curious about their area. Awesome. I'm going into a high-stakes meeting, and I'll practice listening for my colleague's objectives. Nice. And if they don't share them, by the way, ask. Be interested. I need to listen better. Good. Be consistent. Excellent. Give more information when I speak to people so they know my intentions. Awesome. They won't have to read your mind. They'll know what you want. Affirm colleagues' ideas. Yes. Nice. Actively listen. Good. Understand the other person's objective, like the orange example. Great. Update my presentation notes to be more plain spoken. Excellent. Clear and simple. I like it. Okay, where is it? Be interested and be plain spoken. Be more engaged in the interaction rather than focus on my desired outcome. Nice, nice. There's a zen to that, isn't there? Reinforce that we can be win-win. Nice, excellent. Thank you for all of those excellent examples. I mean, I, I it's totally gratifying to hear you share those. So right before, we're going to jump into Q&A, but just in a minute, I just want to tell you a couple of goodies. Okay, paid for and free, depending on what you like. So the first thing is if you contact us today in any way, you two people who are on this call and contact us are going to win access to a free C-Suite Accelerator coaching session. You'll get to join us. We'll get you that access. It won't cost you anything. Two of you are going to get it if you just contact us for any reason. Second, if you're interested in a deeper dive on some influence school, influence skills, I teach a webinar program that's two parts, Business Rapport Mastery. It'll teach you how to read anybody and begin to influence them in three minutes. The emphasis on how to read other people and to flex to get them moving to your side. It's going to be offered on the 7th and 14th of December from 12 to 1.30. The price for this is $249, but because this is an awesome Terrier experience we're having right now, if you guys uh, sign up today, and this is a special today only, um, $99. And the way you can do that is contact my assistant, Gail, at 212-332-7150. I'm going to show these uh, numbers on the page soon. 
or you can email her at gAlexander at ShachterConsulting.com. Note that uh, Schachter has two CHs. Now I know. It's not my fault. My parents did this. Okay. gAlexander at ShachterConsulting.com or the number. You can also, if you want a free uh, companion guide to the program we did today that's basically a tool for you to use on these five key behaviors, you can text right now how to flip to 44222. It'll ask for your email and you'll get it in your email, bo email box. And so then finally, that's everything. The class, Business Report Mastery, be in touch that way. Action Guide, there's the instruction I shared with you. If you don't want any of that, but you just want to visit the website, there it is. If you want to connect with me on LinkedIn, there it is. I'd love to connect. I'd love to be in touch. Love to be helpful. With that, thank you so much. I'd be delighted to answer some questions if you have any. And thank you, Ephraim. And I have to say, you know, I know um, this is something that you're doing, I assume, for your livelihood. So I appreciate that you uh, did today's session as a volunteer. Uh, and you also had shared with me some of the online sessions that you um, share with some of your, your paid clients. And I, I found it to be really well done. And, and I still have my notes from uh, watching the, the video that you shared with me. So I uh, definitely encourage all of our folks today to, to check those out. Anton wanted to make sure uh, he typed in with a question. The master class that you mentioned, that's a webinar. People can participate from wherever they are, right? Absolutely. It's a okay. webinar delivered in two sessions. And if you can make one, but you can't make the other, we're going to make uh, replays available to you. Perfect. So we have one question that came in from Corey. And again, I want to remind all of our guests today to uh, go ahead and, and take this advantage to ask Ephraim some questions by typing into the Q&A chat box. Corey's question, um, and I'm paraphrasing here, was basically, um, so for all of the key behaviors that you outlined, when you're dealing with any given individual at work, how do you know sort of which one to focus on first? You know, with all five of those key behaviors, um, it may be tough to focus on each one at simultaneously. So any tips on how to sort of, uh, I guess, diagnose any given situation and where, where to start? I love it. Uh, I'm going to answer it somewhat differently. I'm just going to say, you know, I'm a big believer in the, the 2080 rule, you know, Pareto principle that says that 20% of the effort produces 80% of the result. Um, and in this instance, I'd say it's about listening. I'd say it's curiosity, key behavior number two. The wisdom you can glean is from knowing what your colleague is trying to accomplish. You know, it, there's an old saying, um, in order to influence, you have to be influenceable. That doesn't mean you give away the store. It just means I have to know what you're hoping to accomplish in order to move this conversation along in a way where I take care of both of us. And if I can help take care of both of us, you're going to want to keep coming back. So all of the other behaviors, I'd say, really emanates from that. I hope that's helpful. Thank you. And, and Julie's typed in a question here that I'm interested to hear your answer. What advice do you have for introverts that are trying to implement these <laughs> strategies for infl influencing people? Yeah. So first thing I'm going to tell you, it's a, it's a funny thing because I'm actually about to release a, a, <laughs> a program for an introvert's guide to the C-suite. Um, the, here's the dilemma for introverts, and I'm an introvert as well. Was it Julie? Is that the name? I'm sorry, I forget the name. It was Julie, yeah. Julie. Julie, I feel you, darling. Um, the, um, the challenge for us is we live in an extrovert's world. And so what I'm going to tell you is, first things first, for you is be transparent. <laughs> we introverts tend to listen an awful lot before we weigh in. And I'm going to tell you that the number one mistake that introverts make in meetings and in other business gatherings is they don't weigh in. So being transparent, coming and saying, this is what I think and this is the, re the rationale. You're already probably good at listening if you're an introvert. So then you go into the win-win part where you start to say, let's figure out a way to make this happen together. Right? So the first is where you share your opinion, you weigh in, you make yourself heard, and you say it with a bold voice. And you say it with declarative sentences. And the second piece is you jump in the mix to try to help facilitate and work out a solution. Err on the side of being proactive. Err on the side of if, if you think that there was someone like a social scientist, if there was like a, a one-way mirror in the room 
and that your work meeting was an experiment. And there were social scientists behind the one-way mirror taking notes on all the behaviors. Err on the side of imagining that you want those people taking notes on the other side to believe you're an extrovert. In other words, they watch what you do. They watch the way you interact. They watch you offering your opinion. And they say, oh, well, she's proactive about that. I'd love to say, you know, there's a great book that came out by Susan Cain called Quiet. And it's about the value introverts have. And so I have very mixed feelings about it because on the one hand, it's like, yeah, exactly. I want everybody to know that. On the other hand, it's not going to help you. <laughs> Asking people to understand me doesn't help me. What helps me is jumping into the mix and helping myself understand other people and helping them accomplish their goals and know who I am. I hope that's helpful, Julie. Awesome. Thank you, Ephraim. And Julie, I, I want to mention too, I, I know I told everybody at the top of the hour here that uh, we record our webinars and make them available for on-demand viewing. And we have a great session from just a couple months ago. I have an alumna named Caitlin uh, who lives in Australia who did a presentation for us on um, being an introvert in the extroverted world of work. I would definitely encourage you to visit our website to check that out. And I'm putting up a note here so you can see the actual URL. Uh, it's at bu.edu slash alumni slash webinars. And, um, and if, anybody, if any of you want to watch Ephraim's session here, today again we'll have that up on our website uh, probably in about a week or so there was a little bit of a process that has to be done for closed captioning uh, that we do so um, Ephraim we're running up against the hour here uh, thank you for an amazing presentation I think that what I appreciate about you and your um, your style is uh, that you're you know you're illustrating some really um, important points but in a way that's really uh, somebody can execute, you know, it's something that people can start working on today. Uh, and so thank you so much for, for carving out all the time you did for us and for the alumni around the world that are going to see this. Thank you, Jeff. And thanks to everyone who shared the time with us. I also want to thank all of our guests for, for participating today. I especially want to thank our donors. We wouldn't be able to do this kind of work uh, without your support of the university. We have an incredible lineup of webinars coming up in the next few months at our next session. Uh, would be particularly interesting to anyone who's like me, maybe frustrated with the state of the healthcare industry in the United States. On December 1st, we have a Questrom alumnus named Dr. Dan Newman, whose session is going to be called Healthcare IT Interoperability. IT is easy, sharing is hard, and it's going to be about just the sort of business of healthcare, the way that all of these great technologies are available for tracking patient data and health outcomes, uh, but the fact that, you know, different organizations and different systems uh, don't speak to each other. Uh, so I definitely encourage you to check that out. You can view the schedule of all of our upcoming webinars on our website now at bu.edu slash alumni. And as always, if you or any BU alumni you know would be interested in pre uh, presenting a professional development webinar like this, I ask you please contact me at the Alumni Relations Office or by email at jtmurphy at bu.edu. Thank you again, Ephraim. Thank you everyone for your time. Have a great day or a great evening wherever you might be.